Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Atlanta Council for this month's Cyber Risk Wednesday event. And also welcome to those who are joining us online. I'm Barry Pavel. I'm the director of the Brent Scowcroft Center on International Security here. Uh, I'm really excited to be uh, to watch this event and learn. Uh, today's event looks like it will provide an exciting and relatively unique for Washington, at least look into uh, the DEF CON black hat and besides conferences, otherwise known as Hacker Summer Camp, that just wrapped up last week in Las Vegas. Um, most of you know, well, some of you know, but not all of you know, that DEF CON and Black Hat were founded in the 90s and, and are two of the largest hacker conventions in the world, founded by our uh, non-resident senior fellow, Jeff Moss, although I think that preceded our affiliation with him. Um, attendees include computer security professionals, as well as journalists and lawyers, federal government employees, students, and I heard even some politicos uh, this year. The conference features uh, presentations and hands-on training and also some contests such as Capture the Flag, which is a, a competition where teams attempt to attack and defend networks and computers. Besides is a community-driven security conference that coincides with other major hacker conferences taking place in cities around the world. Uh, fresh off the plane from Las Vegas today, so we can have all the Vegas jokes uh, today's panelists will summarize uh, the dozens of hacker um, presentations and briefings that were delivered at this year's conferences. And through this conversation, we hope to really help bridge uh, uh, the technical and policy communities. We really want to help translate the technical solutions delivered by hackers in Vegas into uh, more informed and digestible policy options that government officials here in Washington can consider, uh, develop, and, and execute. This is part of our monthly Cyber Risk Wednesday series, which is designed to bring cyber experts together uh, with um, experts from government and industry and policymakers to examine topics at the core of our mission uh, today. So I'm going to keep this short so we can learn more. Um, uh, let me just briefly introduce the panelists, but um, I'm not going to go through their full bios. You have those available. Um, if you would like, Dr. Lori Faith Craner is currently the Chief Technologist at the Federal Trade Commission, where she is responsible for advising Chairwoman Edith Ramirez and the Commission on Developing Technology and Policy Matters. She delivered a keynote uh, on protecting consumers in the age of connected devices at DEF CON and delivered also the opening keynote at Besides. Uh, the panelists were calling Space Rogue. I've never done that before with a panelist, <laughs> a.k.a. Chris Thomas. <laughs> is a strategist at Tenable Network Security, where he helps clients understand how to apply the unique advantages of continuous monitoring, as well as how to meet compliance and security challenges. He's testified before uh, Senate committees and also has served as the editor for the Hacker News Network, which I hear is getting more popular than this cable news network. Uh, Jason Healy is a senior research scholar at Columbia University School for International and Public Affairs, specializing in cyber conflict competition and cooperation. Uh, Jay also is a non-resident senior fellow here at the, uh, in our cyber initiative and was the founding director um, of the initiative. He delivered talks both at Black Hat and DEF CON and is on the call for pap papers review board at DEF CON. Bo Woods, who will uh, moderate the discussion, is the deputy director of our cyber initiative in the Brent Scowcroft Center. His focus is on the intersection of cybersecurity and the human condition primarily around cyber safety. He organized the I Am the Cavalry track at Besides and is one of the volunteer operators called Goons at DEF CON. And I always wanted to call you a goon. <laughs> uh, and before we, before we start, I'd like to thank our media partner, Passcode, um, from the Christian Science Monitor for joining us. And I encourage all of you to join the conversation on Twitter using our uh, usual hashtag for these events, which is hashtag ACCyber, um, and also at CSM passcode. Uh, during the Q&A session, we will be answering your questions from the Twitter stream, so I strongly encourage you to, to submit such questions. And with that, panelists, please take the stage and let's begin. Hello, welcome. Um, I am Bo Woods, as Barry uh, said, Deputy Director of the Cyber Statecraft Initiative. Uh, it's good to see so many people uh, crammed in here on a nice hot August day. 
Um, I know that Vegas uh, or uh, August is typically vacation month for a lot of DC, so I'm very pleased to see so many folks in here uh, eager to hear about what happened in Vegas. Um, I wanted to start by just doing a little bit of background on what the hacker community looks like if, uh, if you've never been there. Um, I'm somebody who's spent quite a deal of, of my time uh, in the past 10 years engaged with the hacker community or the security researcher community uh, at events like DEF CON, uh, B-Sides, uh, Black Hat, and some of the others. Um, you know, this community is, is probably the only one that I know of that goes to you know, maybe a dozen conferences a year and brags about having never seen a talk in any of them. Uh, that's kind of a running joke, although it's uh, actually true. Uh, you go to these events not for the content, because they're almost always recorded and, and uh, then put online for free later, but because of the interactions there. Uh, and it's an incredibly vibrant, diverse, uh, and, and really um, fun community. Uh, there's about 2,000 events that happen every year in the information security community, uh, and that was the last count from um, a group that was tracking that before they just stopped tracking. So if you think about it, 2,000 events, 52 weeks a year, that's like a lot of events. <clears throat> it's hard to keep up, it's hard to attend uh, even some of them, uh, uh, even some pr proportion of them. Um, I think that one of the things that makes this community great, and one of the reasons why uh, you see DC kind of uh, hesitantly rushing towards it, is because the pace of innovation uh, is so great right now, especially in computer connected technologies, um, that the only way to keep up, to stay on the cutting edge, uh, is to be embedded within this community. So uh, it's true that government moves slow. That's by design. You don't want a, a government that moves too quickly or they'll miss some of the important broader trends. Um, corporations and the private sector move faster, uh, but the only thing that moves at the, the cutting edge, the real bleeding edge, is these communities of interest that form, particularly the hacker community, the biohacker community, uh, and some of the other groups uh, that, have, that have spawned uh, that get together. Um, and this year at, uh, uh, at DEF CON, there was a biohacking group that was doing uh, implantable chips in your hand. So if you've ever wanted to have uh, an RFID chip in your hand and be partially a robot, um, next DEF CON, you get your chance. Uh, so I want to give a little bit of perspective on a couple of the, um, uh, the conferences and then turn it over to Jay uh, to give perspective on uh, some of the others. Uh, the B-Sides Las Vegas uh, conference uh, is about 10 years old um, and it runs uh, concurrent with Black Hat uh, at the start of the week. So uh, there were, this year there were 2,600 per, 2, participants across nine different tracks in two days. Uh, and this is a conference that's organized by the community for the community. It's 100% free entry. Um, and uh, they, get, they get all of the, the things paid for by sponsors and uh, by donors. They have a huge donor community. Um, for me, it's like the best part of Hacker Summer Camp is going to this event because it's where all the, uh, the people who don't want to go to Black Hat uh, but are compelled to go to Vegas by their companies, they go hang out there. So it's uh, just a great crowd. Um, and that's where we ran the I Am The Cavalry track, uh, which is a, an extension of a lot of the work that we're doing here at the Cyber Statecraft Initiative. Uh, at DEF CON this year, there were more than 22,000 attendees in four tracks, 10 villages, as they call them, which is basically a track within a track or a conference within a conference, uh, and then 40 or more contests and events, uh, officially and unofficially, that happened. And that doesn't include all the nighttime events, the parties, and things like that. So it's a huge community. I mean, if you can imagine something the size of a public university descending on Vegas and taking over a few hotels, that's essentially what this is. Um, <clears throat> For me, the best part of DEF CON is the contests, villages, and event spaces. That's where you go and meet people, actually interact. Um, there's a joke in the, the hacker community. How do you tell an extrovert from an introvert? The extrovert is looking at the other person's shoes when they're talking to them. Um, but that's, that's really a stereotype that we need to bust. Uh, so all of us have been to B-Sides, DEF CON. Uh, we've fit in that space, uh, and we interact really well. Um, so the, 
the chances to interact, well, I say we interact really well. <laughs> Maybe we don't. Uh, but the contests and villages and event spaces are a chance for all the people to get together and talk and to learn from each other. Uh, this year, for instance, there was a car hacking village where uh, you had the opportunity to go up and sit in a uh, Fiat Chrysler America vehicle that had been modified um, uh, in such a way that it was basically, you could play with the shock absorbers and uh, some of the hydraulics. It was pretty cool. We had uh, lessons teaching people how to hack cars. Uh, so it's a really good chance to engage and learn from the community at large and some of the best people in the world. Um, one of my friends runs Car Hacking Village, Craig Smith, um, and he was sitting down with people that he had never met, never heard of, uh, who were just hobbyists in their garage, and he was like, man, these people are doing things that I've never seen in all my time hacking cars. Um, and so that's a pretty amazing opportunity and experience. There's also multiple capture the flag contests, which is basically red team, blue team, offense, defense. How do you hack something? How do you defend something? Uh, how do you... Uh, get certain targeted uh, uh, treasure chests. Um, and some of the level of skill in these competitions are uh, what we normally say can only be done by nation states. And instead, you have hundreds and thousands of people who are engaging in these types of contests. So I think that can satisfactorily bust the myth that only a nation state uh, adversary is what we have to be worried about. Um, when these tools and techniques are available to everybody, uh, it's very, very easy uh, to take advantage of them. Um, we also had a, an IoT village, Internet of Things village. And one of the highlights of that for me was uh, they had a, a remote controllable wheelchair. I don't know why you would want to remotely control a wheelchair, but somebody has made this thing. And uh, it was driving up and down the halls without anybody on it because somebody had figured out how to gain access and just control it and drive it around. Uh, and I think that underscores uh, some of the, the direction that we're going in this whole uh, con completely connected world um, where uh, now that we've got everything connected, it's everywhere accessible, and therefore it can be uh, controlled by anyone who has a, little, a small degree of technical skill and a willingness to use that. Um, there were at least two sitting Congress people at DEF CON this year, uh, two that I know of. Um, I know in past years there have been more at that event. So I think that underscores the importance, at least to some people in DC, why they want to get engaged with this community. Uh, and with that, I'll throw it over to Jay to talk about uh, Black Hat and the Cyber Grand Challenge that DARPA ran. Thank you very much. I'm just curious, how many folks have been to the RSA Information Security Conference? Okay, so, um, so a fair amount, maybe, maybe a tenth of the room. Uh, Black Hat, DEF CON, okay, not bad. The, um, and so RSA is very much an information security conference. Like you go there and you know, there's a booth and they'll shine your shoes and the money will go to charity. DEF CON is not an information security conference. It's a hacker conference. There, the money will still go to charity, but they don't shine your shoes, you get a mohawk. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, I guess I didn't donate enough to charity because they kind of they kind of overdid me. Um, <laughs> the um, and and it very much is about hacking, meaning driven by curiosity, trying to understand a system and figure out if you can make that system do something that you want it to, even if that wasn't necessarily what the makers of that system originally intended it for. Um, so if you think about hackers and hoodies and and you know this is all about F society and, and people making mischief, well, there is that element to it but it's still a lot of people that are just fascinated by systems and want to try and get in and understand it. So Black Hat happens in the earlier part of the week, DEF CON in the later part of the week, B-Sides, and B-Sides conferences are there because on the flip side of some, usually on, on the flip side of some other um, cool conference. Um, one of the biggest things that I think came out of Black Hat um, was we were very pleased because Apple came and they announced a bug bounty program. So you might have followed, this, this really kind of came up in the news most in the last couple months with the FBI Apple hack where FBI wanted access to, to one of the Apple phones for the San uh, Bernardino murderers and um, uh, they ended up using a vulnerability that they bought the use of uh, and it came out a lot that Apple was really the only big company left that did not have this, did not have a bounty, uh, an amount of money that they would pay if you are a security researcher, if you are a hacker and you found a bug 
they would list your name on their website, but that was it. They wouldn't offer you any kinds of rewards. They wouldn't offer you any money. So now they've got bug bounties up to $200,000. Uh, I saw there were some hackers that were there that were, um, uh, had been awarded 1 million uh, points from United because they had found all these points on United, and that was the way that United Airlines, uh, the airlines, not the van lines, um, that United Airlines said that we're gonna reward, we're gonna reward these security researchers that find, find, find these bugs. Um, Commerce Department was, was there in force, and, um, and Alan Friedman of Commerce has been doing a great job pushing, um, trying to get out these vulnerability disclosure programs. So I think for me that was one of my big takeaways. Um, and you might have even seen that DOD has started the Hack the Pentagon program. Um, for security researchers to try and find these bugs in, in Pentagon websites. And, and apparently it was even a win just to be able to call it Hack the Pentagon <laughs> rather than some kind of bureaucratic name, you know, um, DOD vulnerability um, discovery process, comma, amateur. Um, the, I was also really pleased, that one of the things that came out, um, or it was, kind of, it was surprising to many of us in the community, it got a lot of press was Hackers for Hillary, that there was a, an event on Wednesday. And so right from these conferences from the early days, we'll talk about this, especially DEF CON, it was so apolitical. I mean, you had a spot the Fed conference uh, contest where you know, if someone was there that was, a Fed, you know, was maybe a federal agent trying to, to infiltrate the community, it was your job to try and spot them. And more if you were there, you try, as a Fed, you kind of try and hide and not get spotted. And here you were, that was really out of DEF CON. But here you were out of, this, um, out of this community and now you're having this political event. And there was probably 30 people at the event um, co-hosted by Jeff Moss. Uh, he's known to us as Jeff Moss, our senior fellow. fellow. He's known out there as the Dark Tangent, as the founder of, of these conferences and co-hosting this event. Um, so maybe 30 people and maybe an equal number of journalists uh, cover, covering the event. But it really, I think, you know, caught a lot of people as the maturation of the field, like all of a sudden now we matter. Now the, um, uh, we used to have to go to DC to testify and now it, it's coming to us. And I've got one or two other things, but maybe I want a hold off right there and just. I can comment on your Hackers for Hillary um, and the, the event, I think it shows a, as you said, a maturation not yeah. of a lot, mostly of the people that are attending these mm -hmm. conferences. Um, I mean, I, I started this back in my 20s. I'm in my 40s now. So there's, a, there's been people that have gone, DEF CON has gone on for 20, 24 years, uh, and people have sort of grown up with that. Also, we're seeing a change in, uh, in government attitudes towards, mm -hmm. quote, hackers. Um, you know, 20 years ago, it was nothing but uh, FBI raids. Now you have groups like Commerce and FDA and FTC uh, and DOD who are reaching out and trying to bridge that gap and trying to access that knowledge and that expertise and saying, hey, come help us out. So we're seeing a change from a completely adversarial relationship mm -hmm. between government and the hacker community. And it's starting to thaw a little bit where there's a lot more cooperation now. It hasn't completely thawed, yeah. but it's getting there. And, and uh, this got brought up, I mean, for some of you that know your hacker history and your, your internet history, right, when Space Rogue and his friend, I mean, when you guys at the Loft testified in front of Congress right. in 90... In 98, 98. so uh, Loft Heavy Industries testified at the, I forget the name of the committee now, one of the Senate committees. <laughs> um, we made it a very distinct point to only use our handles. Um, and our handles are in the official record. I'm in there, uh, you know, Senator John Glenn called me Space Rogue on the record. <laughs> um, and we did that because we were afraid of reprisals from other companies and other p parts of government. And so we made it a big, big point of only using our hacker handles. Um, that has changed, obviously. I now use my real name, uh, Chris Thomas, uh, but everybody still calls me Space or Space Rogue, uh, or SR. Um, that's sort of my identity and who I am. But it sort of shows, again, a little bit of the thawing and the relationship between government and hacker types. Yeah, and uh, Lori is the lone Fed on the panel. <laughs> spotted. Um, spotted the Fed here. I'm, I'm wily. Uh, you were uh, also participating in, um, were you in Meet the Fed? 
I, w I was on the Meet the Feds panel. Yeah. So we used to do Spot the Fed, where we would try and out Feds. And now we invited Feds to a panel to sit there and, and engage in a productive conversation. Well, there got to be too many Feds. Right. <laughs> right. That's so right. It used to be if you spotted a Fed, you brought them up on stage, and, and, and you get a T-shirt. And then they changed the rules. Well, the Fed has to have arrest powers. Then you could get a T-shirt. Yeah. And then it was just like, well, there's too many of them here. Yeah. And now Half even so Jeff Moss is a Fed. Now right? Jeff Moss is a Fed. You know, so Peter Zatko's Mudge is a yeah. Fed, right? Why don't you tell us a little bit about um, why you were out there from the government uh, and why you, uh, what you found valuable about Meet the Fed? Yeah, yeah. So uh, the FTC was out there. We actually brought our own Fed T-shirts to wear so that we were easily spotable. <laughs> um, we, we, cool T-shirts. Yeah, yeah. We, we made special uh, FTC DEF CON shirts, and there, there's a secret code that you can crack on them. Um, I made it up myself. <laughs> um, is it ROT13? <laughs> it is not ROT13. Um, so uh, we were out there because we wanted to do outreach to the hacker community and to let people know what our agency does and that we're interested in hearing about research that people are doing that can help us understand vulnerabilities, in, especially in IoT systems, uh, give us ideas about how we can um, protect consumers from scams, from fraud, um, and we wanted to, to make those connections. And so yeah, that's yep. why we were there. So um, in the, the spirit of creating your own uh, clothing line, um, <laughs> this wouldn't be bringing DEF CON to DC uh, if we didn't have black hoodies for all of our panelists today. So we have very special Atlantic Council exclusive hoodies for all the panelists. And I'll just uh, hand these out, and then um, maybe we can hold them up and get a photo op. That's right. I think that's far. That's Jay. OK. And while he's doing that, the, um, you know, if you go to, to Black Hat or RSA, you get a badge. And it has your name, and it says Black Hat. Because DEF CON's a hacker conference, it can't just be that simple. Um, they have every year now it's a it's not just a badge it's a circuit I mean I, I believe this is an x86 yep. um, board um, and it's got input output it's got everything you'd need and people are out and there's badge competitions where the hackers are going what will this badge let me do what can I do with it and and they will actually get in and discover the IO ports and discover and discover what the, what the badge does yeah so uh, let's hold our, our sweatshirts up so people can this is hoodies. a first Sorry, for the, we've got, our, we've got yes. our hoodies, photo op. And, um, Thanks both for this hoodie. Thank you. I, sure. I, didn't, I didn't have enough, so. You didn't have I enough. I appreciate yeah, that's having right. one yeah. more. <laughs> actually, uh, actually, I mean. Yeah, go ahead. The hackers really have more more hoodies than the I wear general a hoodie population. every day in the winter. Like okay. that's my All right. standard. Okay. Stere stereotype confirmed. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a little chilly in my house. So I like to keep the thermostat down, and, and I keep I wear a hoodie as, a, as my sort of my daily driver behind the keyboard. So. Yeah, uh, and you mentioned the badges, Jay. So I'll I'll go. I've got several of these um, that I picked up there. This is one from the Car Hacking Village. It's absolutely like the Intel community. Like the more badges that you have, <laughs> then then obviously the cooler person you are. That's right. So this is something that uh, was created by uh, some security researchers. And it's got a tool on the end here that plugs into your car. So this is the onboard diagnostics port of your car. It plugs right in. And you can start reading out uh, the codes that are coming across your, your OBD2 port. Um, this, is, uh, this is one from the biohacking village. And this one will read. Uh, near field communications. So you can actually read uh, the implantable chips in your hand. I know you all have them. Um, but you can also read credit cards with it, uh, with the RFID credit cards or with any of your um, passports. Like passports. Uh, if you have a badge to get into your, your house or your workplace, um, be careful if you get too close to me, I might be reading it. Uh, and then I can impersonate you by playing it and, back when I get to your, your home. And this underpins so much of Black Hat and DEF CON. Right? If you go to like a normal information security conference, they'll have talks on how you can improve your business resilience of your company or how to implement a good password program. These conferences in Vegas, these Black Hats, are about we've got this technological infrastructure around us. We don't know how it works, and we assume it's secure. We assume there's people out there that are taking care of it. And what's been running throughout this for 24 years is that 
um, you know, it's this gathering of folks that are driven to understand this technological infrastructure and to come out and try and figure out all these ways that it's not secure. Um, you know, and, and that's why it's so good to see the FTC and the other govs out there to start seeing, um, instead of saying it's illegal to have curiosity about this object and figure out how it works, um, of saying, look, these people are figuring out how that this stuff is completely insecure, much of it, and um, we've, we better work as quickly as they're discovering things, and we better work as quickly as we continue to spew out ever more of this technological stuff, or it's all going to end in tears. Um, there's a great, um, someone, someone tweeted out, it was a, here's what we do, here's what Las, how Las Vegas handles um, gambling machines. And it covered all of these controls that Las Vegas includes for gambling machines, right? Someone can inspect it if you as a player think that the machine is fraudulent. You can, you can go talk to an ins the inspector. There are rules. Um, there are independent testing to make sure it's right. On elect election machines, on voting machines, none of that's true. <laughs> it's illegal to, go, to try and go in and figure out how it works. It's not independent testing. Um, there's not, you know, the FCC has very limited powers compared to the Vegas. And that's what these conferences are trying to get, get to. So would you say it's easier to game an election machine than it is a gaming machine? Well, that did come up a lot. <laughs> and the, um, uh, uh, you know, the coming right out of the DNC hack. And um, I think there's a lot of us that are trying to call more attention to, um, to the election machines. Because if the Russians were going to mess with elections, there's a lot easier, there are a lot more direct ways to do it. It's, it's interesting that you bring up uh, election machines. There is a, a, DMCA, exempt, a DMCA exemption, a Digital Millennium Copyright Act, on election machines that oh, I, I believe that. takes place this year after the election. <laughs> so it allows <laughs> researchers to look at those systems and see if there are vulnerabilities in them without fear of prosecution. But that's a big thing. Uh, it was a, a specific exemption that went through the Copyright Office, uh, Library of Congress, um, and it was mm. very difficult to get. So I hope to see that there's a lot of researchers taking that up this year. Uh, and looking at those machines and seeing if there are any vulnerabilities yeah, Actually, there. at Black Hat, Symantec had an election machine or an election machine simulator for people to come up and try hacking. Yeah, I've been in, uh, at Princeton University, uh, Ed Felton did some research there on, on uh, voting machines. Um, and they still have the one that's there and it's playing Pac-Man. So uh, this is the security level of our uh, of certain devices. But actually, uh, Space had some really good comments uh, earlier today that I saw about um, what it would mean to make those a, a federal. Oh, critical infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. critical infrastructure. So there was a, there was a, a, a comment or a, a, a movement, I'm not sure exactly where it came from, of, of making uh, election computers, and I think we should use the term computer as opposed to mm, machine, yeah. right. um, the election computers as critical infrastructure. Uh, my opinion is that that comes with a bit of baggage. Um, we are, well, for one ring, we already have, I think, seven industries that are labeled as critical infrastructure. And we're getting to the point where, well, gee, everything's critical infrastructure. And if everything is, then nothing is. Um, but we already have organizations in place to take care or to look at these systems and certify them uh, at the national level. NIST has an organization um, that it's a, I forget the name of it, it's the Voluntary Election Commission or something um, that allows local governments. And I think that a lot of people forget that local governments are the ones in charge of elections. It's that the county level or the city level um, and that's how we've always run our elections for the last 240 years. And so declaring them critical infrastructure kind of changes that, mm. uh, how we've done them historically. Yeah. I don't want to rat hole down this too much, but anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think there was any election computer uh, hacking this year. No, I didn't see any at DEF CON other than the uh, sample by at Symantec yeah. booth, yeah. But there was a lot of IoT hacking that was yes. going on, whether you consider it uh, you know, the, the home devices. They had a couple of medical devices this year, um, obviously cars. Uh, did anybody go to the car hacking village or IoT hacking village? I missed it. Missed I, it. I walked through the car hacking village. <laughs> yeah. How I do did know you walk through? It was packed. <laughs> <laughs> very, very slowly. Very slowly. <laughs> I know uh, yeah. there were several talks on both DEF CON and Black Hat on various aspects of car hacking. Um, I know Chris and Charlie, the famous G Packers, were there this year. They had another talk at Black Hat. Um, and, but there were several other people who were also presenting research that they had done in other vehicles uh, at the conferences. Yeah. Um, and I know in, in past years, the FTC has had some booths and things at uh, DEF CON. Um, uh, you guys had some contests 
for uh, stopping robocallers yeah. and other things. What were you guys doing at DEF CON this year? Yeah, we didn't have any contests this year. Um, we're, we're working on cooking up some new contests, but we don't have anything ready just yet. Um, but we, we were there mostly uh, to listen and to do outreach. Mm. Good. And I know um, uh, Whitney was running the Privacy and Crypto Village. Yes, she was. Yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, again, the villages are like a conference within a conference. They have their own tracks. They have things that people can go and explore independently on their own. Um, it's interesting that you bring up that you were there to you know meet people and do outreach because I think, and it, you brought up earlier that the, the running joke is that I went to con and didn't see any talks. Yeah. Because the, for me, the biggest part of DEF CON or, Black, or any of the other smaller conferences that I go to, it's the hallway track, right? It's what we specifically call when you hang out in the hallway and you start talking to people. And I get the most out of any of the cons from the hallway track than I do from any of the conferences, any of the talks. Because I can watch the talks at home once they're recorded. Um, meeting people and engaging and interacting with people I can only do at the conference. Yeah. So for, uh, for most of us, we've been there several times out to, to Vegas to do that. Uh, Laurie, I think it's your first time. Yeah. So because most of the folks in the audience have not been, you probably could serve as the best bridge between DC to what you saw <laughs> at DEF CON. So why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, what you observed as a first time attendee and participant in some of those conferences? Yeah, sure. Um, so I started the week at B-Sides um, and that's, that's kind of the small conference and it's, it's much more accessible because there are less than 3,000 people there. Um, still somewhat chaotic. Uh, I gave the keynote talk there. Um, so imagine a really big room, there are vendors with booths around the edge. Um, there's in one corner, there are people learning how to pick locks. Um, in another corner, there are people who are hacking something, I don't know what. Um, and in the middle, there's like the EFF booth, right? And, um, and I was on the stage trying to talk to these people, uh, most of whom were standing or sitting on the floor. Um, that's how I gave the keynote talk. Um, uh, but it, it was fun, and, and I did do some audience participation, um, made them raise their hands and stuff. Uh, um, so uh, it, it, it was um, uh, chaotic, but, but uh, a good experience in meeting people. Um, I had actually never tried picking a lock myself, and I wandered over to the lock picking area, and a volunteer immediately rushed up to me and handed me a lock and a lock pick set and showed me how to use it. And, you know, it didn't take very long. I now know how to pick locks. Watch out. Um, <laughs> um, uh, and then I also did a, a career panel there where uh, they had a room where they were interviewing people about their careers and taking questions from the audience. Um, and so um, I, I talked with them about the various careers that I've had and took a lot of questions and it was fun. Um, then I went to Black Hat. Um, and this is a very corporate, um, you know, very polished uh, event. Um, and there you get name badges that actually have your name on them. I mean, you'll notice there, there's no name on this badge. <laughs> You're completely anonymous. And uh, the, the B-Sides badge was actually like a poker chip. Um, it did not have a name on it either. Um, so, so yeah, Black Hat was, was, was very corporate, very, um, um, uh, you know, lights, flashing lights. They had this whole like breaking glass thing, and they had the breaking glass sound when the speakers come on the stage. And, um, and uh, there was a big vendor vendor area where everybody's handing out free T-shirts. And I brought back a whole big bag for my kids of T-shirts. Um, I don't have to go shopping for back to school. Um, and then, uh, and then I went to DEF CON, and you know, DEF CON is like 20,000 people. Um, you, you don't get, you don't register in advance, so there's a lot of lines of, to, to, you know, to, to pay and to get into all the sessions, and it's, it's, um, it's very chaotic, but just so much creative energy. Um, you see all these people, and they're all huddled together, and you look, and like they're all soldering something. <laughs> what are you soldering? It looks cool. Um, so, and the the contests were also. So um, really interesting. Um, the DARPA Grand Challenge um, uh, was um, it was really exciting. Um, the DARPA Grand Challenge, you know, had uh, teams had had built computers to hack into other computers, and the teams had nothing to do during the event. The computers were just going, um, but they had um, running commentary and visualizations to make it really exciting. 
Um, so that, that was very, very interesting. Um, the other point I want to mention is um, being there as a woman, um, there is only about 10% women at these events. Um, so it, it is kind of isolating. Um, and you know, for the most part, I found it, it was a fairly comfortable environment. Um, but there were, there were still a few things going on, especially at DEF CON, that, that were uncomfortable to be there as a woman. Yeah, so uh, going back quickly to the Cyber Grand Challenge, um, I always kind of have seen this, or always, for the past week I've seen this as like <laughs> the Gary Kasparov versus Deep Blue, IBM, and whether or not man or machine is the better hacker, right? Um, so when will Skynet be here? <laughs> and uh, how many of us will be left at the end? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's crazy. And it was interesting, the, um, so the, the winner of the Grand Challenge, um, the team that had uh, a Carnegie Mellon faculty member and, and um, other people associated with CMU, and then the winning um, human team was also from CMU, and they actually <laughs> played each other. The humans beat the machine the, this time, but but the machine did pretty can, can well, I, all considering. And, and let me just give some depth on the Cyber Grand Challenge. So it had been going on for a couple of years, DARPA, in their series of Grand Challenges, where they said, we want to have, you know, so DEF CON has this capture the flag, where you've got a team of humans that will have a, a, a series of computers, and they will have to defend that system and try and patch it, as well as going out and trying to attack all the, other, all the other human teams that are playing. So DARPA said, can we do this autonomously? So that we've got, they, they ended up the finalists, seven finalists of supercomputers um, that had to be built and programmed by these teams. Um, and it had basically a, a, a made up operating system they called Decree. So, you know, a program that would pretend to be email and another would pretend to be web. And the computers would have to, uh, the referees would release, okay, here's some new code. And the supercomputer would have to keep the code running because they get points for availability. They would have to spot any vulnerabilities in that code and then decide when it was best to patch it, giving the least loss to availability. And then when it found bugs, go out and try and hack the other teams that hadn't found and patched that yet, all while gaming it and trying to figure out, should I patch first or should I hack the other guy first until, some, until I think they know it? Technologically, the CGC, the Cyber Grand Challenge, is really a major step forward. And I applaud DARPA for bringing yeah, that to really DEF CON. Incredible. Five years ago, I don't think we would have ever seen that at DEF CON uh, with that level of, of federal involvement at that show. So I think the fact that DARPA was able to do that and bring it to DEF CON really shows how both groups are starting to come together and take advantage of each other. There were 600 or so vulnerabilities that they built in for the computers to find. And I think the computers found something like 350 or 400 of those. They found a bunch of bugs that the programmers didn't know were there, that the referees didn't even know were in the system, but the supercomputers found it. And they included some famous bugs from history, like, like, like the one that led to SQL Slam, or like the one that led to Heartbleed, or like the one that led to the Morris Worm. And these computers were finding them and patching them in like five minutes. It's also, I think, I think Mayhem was, was, the, was the name of the machine yeah. that won, then competed in the human capture the flag, right. uh, and didn't do as well, we'll say <laughs> that. Um, so we don't have to worry about Skynet today, uh, maybe next year. That's good. Yeah. The, uh, uh, the theme of this year was Rise of the Machines. And actually, uh, there's, so there's a, a big prize at the end of DEF CON for some of the best competitors, some of the best contests. And they call it the Black Badge or the Uber Badge. Uh, and if you get the chance, go out and look at the video of this thing, because it's, it's actually made by a Hollywood um, stunt effects artist. And it's a 3D badge, and like the eye pops out and rolls around and looks at you funny. And but, but that's not as good as the award for the Cyber Grand Challenge, because the team that won, won two, got $2 million. Yes. So it was really, it was really <laughs> pretty, uh, pretty cool. Um, but I don't think DARPA is going to do another Grand Challenge for, for autonomous um, computer security. And, and, and I think it's too bad. I, I, I hope we are going to do another one of these because I think the lessons that came out of this were pretty important. I, I would suspect such a challenge to be picked up by another organization, maybe yeah. DEF CON itself and mm -hmm. maybe not DARPA. But I could definitely see that being yeah. a contest in a couple of years. Yeah, and there was actually a, there was a, a small contest that went on. Uh, they called it, uh, uh, that one was, um, 
uh, Schemaverse, which is a database. Uh, I don't, I'm not a database person, so I might butcher this, but essentially you have to do database commands to play a space game and take over the universe. And so a lot of this was people manually doing these database commands or scripting it so that they could run it 100 times. The winner built an AI in SQL <laughs> to be able to play this game and came out with, I think, 299 out of the 300 prizes. Um, so I think you're right. I think that DEF CON will continue to be a place where we'll see the, the rise of machines and the advancement of AI. And, and before we go to, I know we'll probably go to questions, and I just did want to talk about the talks, because I'm on, I'm on the review yes. board that does Please review do. the talks. So um, <laughs> the, uh, we got about 600 talks, uh, maybe 650 talks that were proposed this year. Um, we had to whittle that down, I think, to about 80 that made it through. Um, and there was a lot this year, and, and it, it's fun because you can see this and you know what, um, what the hackers are interested in and, and where people's attentions are going. So there's a lot more Internet of Things that's coming in. Um, and uh, especially there was a lot in there on locks, um, about being a, a lot of these smart locks are, you know, that, that maybe Bluetooth lock, you get close and you enter into your code in the phone and it'll unlock. And people being able to, um, uh, unlock those from a half a mile away. A lot of these locks weren't, aren't even using passwords um, or they're sending passwords in the clear. So all you have to do is set up an antenna um, with modest knowledge and you can see these packets going by and you can know what that and, and, you, and you can do these. The only good lock that they tested out of, I think about 10 or 20, that actually had good physical uh, cyber security, had the physical security was so bad you could just bump it open with a screwdriver. And so, um, you know, we're still trying to get that balance right. But here it is, it's something designed for security. It's a freaking lock. And it was still sending passwords in the clear. It wasn't, it wasn't trying to encrypt the passwords or any of yeah. these other stuff. So it was really incredible on that. I was seeing a lot coming in on, uh, as we talked about, on cars. There's a lot coming in on drones. A lot of the stuff on drones, I think, is still a little bit <coughs> gamey. Um, uh, but there is some interesting stuff in there. I mean, I saw one talk by Chinese a Chinese researcher on using GPS spoofing. He had real-time GPS spoofing to be able to throw off a drone and make it, and make it do what he wanted. So that that's was, why my Pokemon Go is not Exactly. <laughs> um, exactly. Now, that was still for commercial drones. Um, but again, this is how Iran supposedly took down one of the U.S. stealth drones um, a couple of years ago. So, um, you know, if this thing is, if GPS spoofing is now starting to get so easy that one single researcher can control it with a joystick. Um, and, there was, and there's also, uh, just one last on the cars I'll mention, um, uh, another set of Chinese researchers doing really interesting work on how you can throw off the sensors on autonomous vehicles. I um, mean, all different ways of throwing off their LIDAR, of throwing off their um, ultrasonics, of throwing off, and all different ways to confuse and defeat those sensors. Um, and it's still a research project, but you can easily see how in two or three years from now, if someone wanted to, they could equip a car for this and, and cause havoc on the roads among, amongst the vehicles amongst them. So again, another one of these examples of curious people coming in and saying, you know what, we're building this stuff, we have this dependence on this, and yet the dependence is, is misplaced. Yeah, and I think there was also a talk about uh, uh, ransomware on thermostats. Right, 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 yeah, one? yeah, yeah. Yeah, so some researchers built a proof of concept uh, ransomware virus that they manually loaded onto um, a thermostat. And they went through some tortured steps to get it on there, but it demonstrates yeah. that, you know, even Internet of Things, home Internet of Things devices can have this type of thing on there. And if you think back to March, I think it was, the Atlantic Council released a paper on smart homes. And in it, we called out these types of things. We had a a really cool like haunted house scenario <laughs> where the Internet of Things in your home gets taken over by hackers or malfunctions or breakdowns between corporations uh, that are trying to compete with each other uh, and what can be the possible outcome. So I'll uh, take a minute to, to talk about that. Um, and, and two last things for, for me. Um, one is when you see these stories come out, you should always ask, like one of the first things that we do when we send one of these talks is, how do you have to get access to the system? And on some of these, like the example Bo just talked about, you basically had to trick the user into putting code into, into the thermostat. Um, I saw another great one on, it was for a, um, 
attacking the kernel in Windows and Apple. I mean, so the base, base level of, of program within computer, but you had to have physical access. They call it the evil maid attack, right? If someone you know, can get physical access in your, in your hotel room, they can get can completely own the computer. And, um, and so that's one of those key questions. You're able to do this remotely. Do you have to have physical access, or do you have to try and trick someone into, do, in, into doing it? Yeah, there's a common tenant in hacker circles that once you have physical access, all bets are off. Yeah. So uh, you know, if you're standing at the console, you can basically do anything and own the machine. Yeah. The key is whether or not you can get remote access yeah. and remote RCE or remote code execution. Well, at, at Black Hat this year, there was a track for the first time on human factors to look oh, at cool. you know, how, how easy or difficult is it to trick humans into you know, basically cooperating in your yeah. attack. And, yeah. and I'd like to see more on the flip side of that, which is how do you make, um, how do you make security so easy that it's easier to do thing, yeah. things do more securely? Right, thing, yeah. right. Yeah, and, and, um, and that was actually also part of the, the human factors track. Yeah, good. Uh, so we've got about 10 minutes left. Maybe we'll go through and just do like a, a final impressions before we open it up for questions to the audience and to Twitter. Uh, if you want to submit a question, hashtag AC Cyber, uh, tweet that out and uh, we'll get back to it. So, uh, Laurie, maybe what was your uh, biggest surprise, uh, the thing that you hated the most, and then uh, maybe what your takeaway was? Oh, wow. Um, all right, so the thing that I hated was Hacker Jeopardy. Um, which, which was, uh, it was supposed to be a fun contest, um, but it's a fun contest that, that involved a hostess stripping down to her underwear. Um, didn't really feel that was appropriate. Um, and uh, let's see, surprise. Um, I don't know, there were just lots of surprises. Um, uh, I, I, because I do a lot of work in usable security, the human factor stuff I thought was fascinating. Um, I went to a really interesting talk um, from a forensic linguist who was analyzing scammer phone calls for their linguistic features so that we could better spot scammers, uh, telephone scammers. So I thought that was pretty cool. And what was your takeaway? Oh, takeaway. Um, uh, I mean, this is this is a really uh, vibrant community, and there's um, there's just a lot of interesting and also scary things going on out there. <laughs> yeah. All right, space. Same three questions: biggest surprise, thing you hated most, and biggest takeaway. I'm going to try to merge them all together. <laughs> um, I think I was really surprised at the level of interaction this year versus past years. I mean, I've been going to DEF CON now for almost 20 years myself. Um, the interaction between government and hacker types. And mm -hmm. I'm really glad and frightened at the same time to see at what level that's happening. Um, both sides are bringing baggage. Uh, you mentioned Hacker Jeopardy, which I would love to see some changes made to that event. Um, on the government side, we still have uh, raids and prosecutions that shouldn't be happening. Mm -hmm. um, but despite that baggage and despite those, those obstacles, we're still trying to reach across, reach across the aisle, if you will, um, and trying to help each other out. And I'm both surprised at that yeah. and scared, and, and you know, that's been a, that was a takeaway for me at, at DEF CON this year. If I can stay on the surprised and scared comments yeah. there. The, um, because that's been what, you know, uh, when I led this program, you know, when we started this program and how Bo has picked it up and now that I'm teaching at Columbia, you know, it's that how can we, how can, can we step across these two communities? You know, that's why we had technologists like Jeff Moss and Dmitry Alperovich you don't want to be senior fellows with our program because we wanted to be in that space. They knew they couldn't solve it just in technology anymore. They needed to help solve here. Um, the, and so my talk at DEF CON was uh, I've never been scared or f more scared, scared or? Uh, more scared <laughs> for a talk. Um, because I, my, I was talking about the vulnerability equities process, some research that we did at Columbia. So this is the white, now, now the White House led process on what zero-day vulnerabilities does the government keep and which does it, is it going to share to the vendor? And I asked this crowd at the beginning, do you think the government keeps a hundred to it, hundreds to itself, thousands to itself, more or less? And I would say, out of the audience, probably two-thirds said hundreds, thousands, or more. And as far as we could tell, the answer is actually in single digits, that we were off by and that's probably what I would have thought beforehand going into this research. We were probably off by two orders of magnitude. Um, as a matter of fact, last year it looks like the government kept two. Not 200 or 2,000, but two vulnerabilities. And I was really worried in that crowd with someone with my background. Again, you know, I'd, I'd come through the spot, the Fed era, 
and here I was, a former NSA guy, former, former White House guy, delivering this message that NSA and the US government is less evil than you think. <laughs> and, um, and I did not get egged, and, uh, and I haven't visibly <laughs> been hacked yet. Um, but I'll tell you, I was really worried about that talk. Yeah. So I think for me, uh, the biggest surprise was the, the quality of the people there, uh, technically, to be able to do things that I had, even with my background, I hadn't expected to be possible. Um, the guy who won the, the car hacking uh, challenge, he was 20 year, 21 year old. He had on a hat that said, I just turned 21, right? Because he had been out partying. And he, <laughs> he, he managed to do this in a number of hours, right? Not days, but a number of hours. Uh, and you can actually see a graph. Um, when you were there, they had it projected on the wall and it was like everybody, was gradually gaining points, and then he came in and went from virtually zero to just done in a couple of hours. So when 21-year-old kids are able to do this, uh, I think that underscores uh, the capabilities that exist even within this community. Um, the worst thing was the crowds. Uh, 22,000 is a lot trying Especially to get in between valleys, valleys and Paris. And Paris. Yeah. So, yeah. Just, that's, so that's we crazy. gotta, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna need a bigger boat. Uh, I think yeah. is the lesson. For I think they're going year. to Caesars next year. Yep. They are going to Caesars next year, which should be bigger. Um, although it has more bottlenecks. Yes. So we'll see how that works out, it's particularly those escalators. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and then the takeaway was, as everybody else has seen here, said here, the amount of collaboration, cooperation, friendly interactions among everybody there. Um, no fights between feds and hackers. Uh, fortunately for everyone, um, I think the the worst was people falling asleep because they had been partying all night and, and being <laughs> escorted back to the elevators to go to go sleep. Um, so with that, I think we'll uh, open the floor for questions. Uh, and again, we'll be taking questions on Twitter. Uh, and we've got a couple of mics that will run around here in person. So let's start in the room first. And I saw your hand first up in the green jacket. This. Mike Nelson with Cloudflare. A um, number of our people were, were there as well, and I was very glad to hear that congressmen and other feds were interacting with mm -hmm. some of the smartest people in the room. The question I had was whether any of you heard policy complaints from the hackers and the technical people you talked to. Specifically, were people complaining about the Vassanar agreement that would make it hard for hackers to work internationally? Were they complaining about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and how that might be fixed? Any other complaints you hear, or there are they, a, are they uh, still ignoring the Washington, D.C.? There was a talk uh, at B-Sides Las Vegas this year, a couple of them anyway, uh, one specifically on CFAA, uh, the problems with it, how things can change or should change, um, uh, recent actions that have been brought in under the CFAA. Uh, that was a big topic of conversation at B-Sides. Um, I don't know if anybody else heard anything else. Yeah. Um, well, as always in the hallway track, uh, you hear lots of complaints about lots of things. Um, policy was one of the chief complaints. Um, in the hacker community, we've kind of run our own ship for a long time. In fact, we bring security to the security conference because none of the actual security people at the hotels and private contractors can figure out how to deal with us. So uh, we've kind of run our own stuff for a long time. And within the past few years, uh, there's been a noticeable uh, imposition from D.C. onto what we do, what we consider our, uh, our ground, right, our home. It's where we play, live, work. Um, and that will naturally have negative side effects, especially when some of the policy making is not as technically clueful as some of the people who are in that room, which is all of it, right, by definition. Um, but I also heard a lot of people uh, both in the room, especially at B-Sides, but also on the periphery, talking not about how bad this stuff is and complaining, but saying, right, we need to fix it. How do we fix it? How do we influence these policy-making apparatus? Uh, and there was, uh, uh, as you mentioned, there was one at, at B-Sides mm -hmm. about DMCA specifically. There was NTIA with Alan Friedman was there talking right. about policy-making. I, I forgot all about it. I was there at that one. There you were there, <laughs> see? Um, <clears throat> there was also one in the, the I Am the Cavalry track where we had policymakers coming up like Suzanne Schwartz to explain recent policymaking things. You were there, obviously, talking about what you were looking for. So I think there's a, a growing attitude among security researchers in that entire community that, like it or not, policy is here to stay. It's being imposed upon us currently. We need to flip that 
and go and figure out how to make something that, um, that makes everybody happy, or at least the most people happy with the best, most technically literate and informed policy. There's, there's a growing movement, if you will, or at least in the circles that I frequent, of people who are trying to get involved and trying to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when the FCC has an open comment period, actually submitting comments, um, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Whereas previously they may not have got involved and just, you know, lobbed complaints from the sidelines. Um, I'm hoping that a larger, that that movement, if that effort continues to grow and infects other people inside the hacker community. Yeah, at the Meet the Feds panel, we, it was 800 people standing room only, and we got questions about how to be more effective when submitting comments to the FCC oh, wow. and things like that. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's yeah. That's right. Um, CFAA is always going to be an issue. Um, you know, Jennifer Granick, others are always going to are always going to bring it up, and, and and you know, don't criminalize curiosity and phrases like that are extremely common, um, uh, both both from mouths and from T-shirts. Um, encryption was always going to be a tough 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 one for this. Um, I was out at Aspen Security Forum right beforehand, and um, you know, and, and, and Brennan was. Um, almost yelling at a cryptographer that asked him a question, saying, this is your problem to fix. Why don't you work harder um, uh, for this? And, and so encryption was always going to be easier. Um, yeah, uh, Vothner only came up a little bit, um, but you know, with, with Mara, with Katie Masaris, and others out there that have done a lot on that issue, it did, it, it did, it did pop up a little bit. And then we say one of the congressmen that was there um, is Will Hurd um, from, from San Antonio. I, uh, I forget which district that is, the Texas. And, um, and he had been, not just um, worked National Clandestine Service, but he had been consulting for one of, the, one of the computer security companies called Fusion X. And so he was of the community before he got elected. He had a computer, he's one of the few people on the Hill who has a computer science degree. Yeah, so. And, so, and so it's great, it is his second year coming out and, you know, and he's not sitting back and you know, holding court as a congressman, he's getting and he's just, he's just mixing it up and, and, and getting in there um, and learning the community. I would love to see more elected officials get involved, either go to Vegas themselves or you know, invite some of us to talk to them, yeah. either way. Yeah. Um, there are enough of us that are more than willing to have meetings and sit downs and actually put the tie on. I'm oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> because it, I think it's important and I think there are a lot of other people in the community that think it's important and are willing to, to engage in that matter. That we would have to take off our hoodie though. Right. Yeah, I got to, yeah. yeah, and our FTC crew, uh, one of our commissioners, Commissioner McSweeney actually came out with us and, and spoke on two panels. Yeah, and I know that there were some, uh, in addition to the elected officials, there were some staffers out there. There were a lot uh, of staffers, yeah. yeah. Uh, which is great to see, and there's more and more staffers who have a background in computer science uh, and in other technology fields who can bring that knowledge and education to bear. Um, so we'll go out to, to Twitter and pull in a question. What is the FTC's stance on end-to-end -end encryption? Um, <laughs> So, so the, the FTC um, uh, would like to see um, encryption used uh, to protect consumers. Uh, we don't have an official stance on end-to-end -end encryption, though. Okay. Yes, we'll go to you. Uh, Zach Biggs with Janes. Um, I didn't make it out to the conference this year, but last year I was at DEF CON and Black Hat, and the common theme for any of the feds who were speaking was basically a recruiting pitch. Come work with us, come work for us, uh, things of that ilk. In the past year, we've seen some significant movement on the policy side when, especially look at defense. So Ash Carter has put uh, forward the Force of the Future initiative, which is supposed to increase the ability for especially cyber experts, to get involved with working for the government and military. Um, we see he brings Chris Lynch from the Defense Digital Service, who wears a black hoodie to all of his high-level meetings and is noted in every article that's written, including by myself, as doing that. But on a basic <laughs> level, there's more communication, but is it working? Is, is there now a willingness to go work for the government? The Pentagon needs 6,400 cyber experts. They've only filled half those slots. Um, is that outreach actually effectively bringing people in to provide the talent? The, there is a dramatic shortage of cyber talent throughout the industry. It's not just a government thing. I think the government is uniquely situated to attract some of that talent. It's not always about paychecks. Um, you know, as a lot of people in this room know, 
government tracks a certain caliber of people, and some of those people work in cyber fields. And I think if the government plays on those aspects of its employment, it's going to attract people. It's going to be difficult, just like it is in, in, uh, in the regular industry. I work for a company called Tenable. We did three recruiting events that I know of in Vegas this year uh, at B-Sides and at Black Hat uh, to try to get qualified candidates. We have just as much trouble as everybody else. Um, I think it's a, a, uh, a issue industry-wide, globally, actually. Um, but I think the, the government is uniquely positioned to take advantage of some things that only the government can take advantage of to try to attract those, those people. So I think the DOD program is allowing even direct commission as like a kernel for cybersecurity experts. So I'm really hoping to see Colonel Space Rogue one of these days. I think that would be, yeah, Sergeant Space Rogue, be pretty cool. <laughs> I did my time. Yeah, I think uh, also there is a, a willingness, it seems, to engage in new mechanisms of uh, working with the community, right? Through uh, Hack the Pentagon, through Coordinated Vulnerability Disclosure Programs, through 18F, uh, and bringing people in in non-traditional ways where maybe it's not somebody's full-time job to come in and fix something, but they're able to engage. And I mean, Laura, you're a perfect example of that. You're not, you are a Fed, you are in the government, but you're also, after your tenure there, you're gonna go back into the academic world. Yeah, yeah, I think there, there are increasingly, we're, we're seeing people who are coming in mid-career or even senior parts of their career uh, for a short-term stint in the government. Um, and actually, a bunch of the feds that I talked to at DEF CON uh, viewed themselves as, you know, th this was a career change, I'm gonna do this for a few years, and then I may go back to academia or industry. Um, also, I, I think um, with the FTC, we, we don't currently have a lot of positions open, but we're very interested in collaborations and bringing in um, uh, faculty members for uh, sabbaticals, bringing in their students for summer internships, having them come sit down and talk to us for a day or two. Um, and those sort of partnerships have actually been incredibly useful to the agency. Yeah. All right. We're going to take one from Twitter now. Um, do we think that um, as a result of this new uh, kind of effort to bridge the gap between DEF CON and DC that's going on, that we will soon see better, more technically literate and informed policies, direction, directives, and legislation? Uh, and if so, how long before that kicks in? I think we're starting to see it now to a little bit. I mean, it's a slow process. I mean, this is DC. Things do not move quickly. Um, we've been working at this for years and years already. Uh, I think it's going to take several more years. But as, we, as new legislation is introduced and new bills are proposed, um, those bills, at least in my experience, what I've been reading, everyone gets a little bit better. You know? mm -hmm. um, and so hopefully that, that continues and we start getting to the point where there are bills that we like. Or, and when I say we, I mean hackers. Because unless we get involved, unless we start mm -hmm. commenting on open comment periods, uh, our views are not going to be heard. Um, but I see that increasing over time, and hopefully that continues. And it's interesting. I mean, there, there is a sense amongst a lot of the hackers that I know that if, if I can break into it, if any can break into it then, it, then it's absolutely not secure and you shouldn't trust it. Um, and that's not the way that policy works. I mean, policy is always working through compromise. You know, if you can make it a little bit better, then, then you're better, better than you were last year. I mean, so, but we are in this race. Can we good, get it good enough, you know, before things really, you know, especially before we roll out IoT, right? The more that we're rolling out the Internet of Things, the more that we're increasing that vulnerability and exposing, exposing ourselves. So you do you still do have that tension in the way people see it. Mm -hmm. Lori? Um, yeah, I, I think we're, the progress is slow, but we are seeing it. And besides in Congress, I think in the regulatory agencies, uh, you know, the, the, the FTC now has um, an Office of Technology, which was started about 18 months ago. So we're bringing that expertise into the agency. The FCC is trying to bring that expertise in. And I think increasingly, um, the agencies are hiring more technical experts who are being involved in the um, policy making process. Yeah, I agree too. I think uh, if you look at the types of engagements that have happened over the last few years, uh, Suzanne Schwartz from the FDA was out uh, speaking at the, the I Am the Cavalry B-Sides track, and one of the things she said uh, was that uh, engagement with that community is what is helping them become better at doing their job in this new dynamic field. 
Um, and I know that uh, there have been several other agencies who have actually engaged and worked closely with uh, the security research community and been better off for it. So I think you know, maybe it will start, uh, if I could summarize our thoughts, maybe it will start with the agencies and, and uh, the different um, kind of hands-on parts of government and move their way up through to legislative and uh, potentially judicial uh, and other areas. At least that can be the hope. All right, we'll go <laughs> to the back. Hi, my name's uh, Jonathan Nichols. I'm uh, wondering about hackers who come from non-traditional backgrounds, guys who don't have degrees, guys who don't have work experience. Um, I'm one of them too. How, so a lot of, a lot of the kids I know don't, um, don't have any of that traditional experience. Mm -hmm. And there doesn't seem to be a traditional career track for those guys. What can I say to the, uh, to the younger hacker kids who don't have that background? How do we get them into the industry uh, in doing the right thing? Um, I mean, I, it, I guess my career track is very non-traditional. I, I won't go into the details, but it, I mean, I started working um, in retail selling computers. So uh, the, I, I, I guess you just got to follow, uh, this is going to sound very cliche, but follow your passion, learn what you want to learn, uh, do your own research, uh, publish your own findings. We have the World Wide Web. It's very easy to publish stuff. Um, follow what you like to do. Become an expert at one small thing. Once you become the expert, somebody's wanting to pay you for your knowledge. Um, and, and that's really a, a way to, to sort of break into the industry. In the meantime, you have to work in computer sales uh, and pay, to pay your bills so that you can follow your dreams and, and follow your passion. And I know that sounds cliche, uh, but really it's just focus on what you like to be and what you like to do until you've reached the point where you are the expert and somebody wants to pay you for that knowledge. And, and it's surprising at how much of that, like when I'm talking to my policy students, uh, some, some of the alumni are here, the, um, I give almost the same advice, right? I mean, publish, you've got to get out there. I mean, we're publishing different things um, and be an expert. And even if we don't want to be an expert in what you happen to be an expert in, just being a hiring manager and knowing that the person can be an expert, okay, good, I know, I'm, I, I know they're trainable. And if anything, I think this field is very open to people that don't have a college degree. Right? It's going to hurt. It's going to hurt them desperately to get them into government if they don't have a degree. But with as much with as much venture capital money as there's been in the in in this field for for 15 years, I mean, talent talent and good ideas, I think, is going to come through. Taking a non-traditional role is definitely more difficult than going high school, four-year college, mm -hmm. grad school job. Um, but it may be more satisfying depending on who you are, and it may you know, help you out in the long run in your life. It, it very varies from person to person and what path you want to take, but um, as you said, it's very much meritocracy driven. If you have the knowledge, uh, there's such a shortage of people, you will get hired. Yeah, that said, a, a degree from SEPA will really help. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I, I would also say, you know, consider going back to school. Hmm. Yeah, um, and you know, I've, I've noticed that in the, the security research community, there tends to be an inverse relationship between education and status. So some of the people at the very top like didn't finish high school, <laughs> if you can yeah. believe it. Um, but I've also noticed in publishing, there's an inverse relationship where in the academic communities and in a lot of circles, the longer you write, the, the more respected the paper. In ours, 140 <laughs> characters is all you get. <laughs> OK, so we'll go back to the audience, uh, the lady back there. Hi, Sharon Bovat, Voice of a Moderate. I have a question. It, this kind of has to do, is there are hackers without borders, kind of like doctors without borders? And the question is because, well, during DEF CON, I was in Cuba, and they're in the process of even getting internet. They've got people coming in from India to set it up. And I talked to a mid-level government official, and he was saying, I said, are you going to have Americans help you with your internet security or Russians? And he said, whoever will help us. And I really want it to be an American. So if there's any way that, like, Estonia is so perfect, is there a way that the hackers, have they talked about that at DEF CON? We're going into third world countries, second world countries, into our neighbor and helping them with infrastructure and security. Thank you. Um, there is an organization known as uh, Hackers for Charity, um, which is actually the charity itself and trying to bring hackers to various organizations. They primarily right now operate in, I believe it's Uganda, um, and they've been there for several years. 
Uh, I believe they're trying to move their headquarters back to the United States and basically be the assistance for other charities. Uh, I don't know if they're interested in going to Cuba or not, possibly. There is some efforts like Doctors Without Borders, if you will. I would like to see more, bigger efforts. I think that's a, mm -hmm. uh, especially in developing nations, that's a very strong point, a very big issue for developing nations, that they need that assistance. Um, and I think that it would be great if maybe we, you know, use the Peace Corps or whatever to try to bring that expertise to some of these other, other countries. Yeah, there's also, there's a few others that I can think of. Um, one is Geeks Without Bounds. They do some things, uh, although it's not exactly uh, that. Um, there's also one called Securing Change, which is run by a guy named Oliver Day. Yeah, that's, uh, a, that's a, I like that organization as well. It's very yeah. small, uh, yeah. could definitely use some more assistance. Yeah, uh, and then there are other people who, I was at uh, the HOPE conference, Hackers on Planet Earth. They run it every two years in New York at the Hotel Pen, which probably should have been torn down. But, you know, hackers can go to it because it's relatively cheap in downtown Manhattan. Uh, but a couple of years at, um, at HOPE, there was a big theme that I noticed of people going into third world countries and doing things like standing up uh, mobile phone infrastructure so that just around the villages in, in uh, these mountainous rural towns that don't otherwise have a way to communicate long distances, they can talk to each other. Um, and there were several other attempts to uh, kind of get outside of the um, uh, first world countries and go and help people in other places, not to impose technology on them when it's not wanted, but to engage and help where they're being pulled in uh, as advisors, as technical experts, as people who can lend a hand. So I'd love to see more of that. And personally, I would love to go to Cuba um, <laughs> and set some of that stuff up. Unfortunately, my boss probably doesn't want me to, to leave what I'm doing. I think there, there's also a trend among academic computer science departments of having mm -hmm. programs to encourage their, um, their undergraduate students to do that sort of thing. So instead of spending your summer working for a US tech company, spend your summer in one of these countries um, you know, teaching computer science or setting up infrastructure or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so we'll go back to Twitter. Uh, there's a question. Um, how do we square the, the visceral fear that some of the people in the community have of the federal government in things like surveillance, prosecution, uh, some of the things that are maybe legacy and historical problems, uh, particularly around law enforcement and, and DOJ, with some of the newer trends, more recent outreach from folks like FTC, uh, FCC, FDA, uh, and some of these other organizations to try and bring this community in for, uh, for the benefit of the government? Maybe Space, we'll start with you. Um, you know, it's a good question. I mean, I, I've talked about that the both sides bring some baggage to the table, um, mm -hmm. and it's, it's been difficult to try to overcome some of that. And, and how we accelerate that process, I mean, maybe it's only, it, we have to, time, time heals all wounds, hopefully. Um, you know, on, on the one side we have uh, legislation such as CFAA, which many in my community feel is, is overhanded and poorly worded, um, but at the other time we have people still breaking into NASA and, and, and DOJ, DOD and DOJ mm -hmm. who shouldn't be. Um, so there's, there's stuff happening on both sides, um, but I think there has been a thawing, if you will, uh, and people trying to, to, to bridge that gap. How do we accelerate that and, re and remove that fear from both sides is, is a challenge. And it's tough. I mean, I don't want to over. I don't want to over gloss the community. Um, you know, I talk about the hacker community being being driven primarily about curiosity, and that's absolutely true. But I mean, certainly when you're at DEF CON, there's a high degree of mischief. Um, you know, one guy he he had a he had a little um, remote control that he developed a couple years ago, and it would take over a wireless mouse because that's not encrypted. And so he could just take over wireless mouse, and he'd be disrupting people's presentation, moving the mouse cursor over. You know, it's kind of fun and games, ha ha ha, mischief. But then you're in, you've got some that are in the full anarchist F society, Mr. Robot mode of, you know, the system is screwed and, um, uh, you know, and, and what we do within that, in, in that system is okay. There's a big talk, incredibly well attended talk, probably 2,000 people on, you know, some guy talking about how, you, how he would fictitiously take down the Kuwaiti government and cause a coup and walking through, the crowd loved it. Um, so, I mean, you definitely do have, I mean, with 22,000 people at DEF CON, you're going to have a wide spectrum right. of different people, um, especially since it's traditionally been a fringe, if you will, part yeah. of society. Yeah, right. um, but at the same time, there are elements within that group 
that are trying to yeah. you know bring positive change and, it, and work across the government. And, and just on the mischief, the, by the way, the most popular men's fashion accessory other than the black hoodie is the is the utility kilt. <laughs> it's been um, it's like cargo shorts, but um, it's extremely popular. And it's really funny when you, when you go and it, you know, if you actually turn on your Wi-Fi on, on your computer, it's hilarious because you get like forty different things that all say Bally's, Bally's guest, Bally's, click me. And, like all of these people have set up these fake wi you know wireless points to try and sucker you into into connecting to them. Yeah, and there's also jokes that people put into the Wi-Fi name like uh, I'm with stupid and you know. FBI surveillance, uh, FBI surveillance van. Surveillance van yeah. number 43. Yeah. 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 The, one of the biggest classic. mischief things that used to happen at a previous hotel um, was there would always be food coloring put in the swimming pools. <laughs> so you'd have you know a blue swimming yeah. pool or a green swimming pool or or a um, uh, uh, bubble bath. Yeah. So you know yeah. you'd have uh, lots a of bubbles. IP, in the we miss you. Yeah. 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 Anyway. All right. Uh, go for another question here. Hi, uh, Andy Purdy with Huawei. Um, you talked about the ways the community can participate, and there's some discussion about they can participate in public comments, the idea they can contribute to potential legislation. Jay mentioned we want to get to the point where things are good enough. Um, I think generally when you look at, for example, what the FTC is doing, move into the unfair practices, we're trying to get a risk-based approach that recognizes that security is a journey, not a destination. And so there are, there are things that are very important, I think, for the community to participate in. One is hopefully the new version of the NIST framework that I hope comes out next year. Another is what the White House talked about in their strategic action plan, which is the underwriter's laboratory standards. The other, which some people in the White House commented favorably on, was a session at Black Hat, which was rating system for software. I mean, is there a way for the community to, to engage in some of those sort of public-private partnership efforts, which seems to be what we're really trying to go forward with as, as a larger community? Well, what, well I was going to say one of my favorites of those is, is I'm the Cavalry. And, and you know, I think, Bo, you know, I'll, 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 I'll introduce Bo on that, but I know you want to. Uh, yeah, well, I'm involved with that as well. And, and uh, the I'm the Cavalry movement is, is sort of uh, Josh Corman and, and Bo basically and some other folks said, look, nobody else is going to fix these problems. Uh, we need to step up and try to, try to fix some of these issues that are, that are out there. And so you know, the cavalry isn't coming, that you are the cavalry. And so uh, the, 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 the organization has been trying to impact public policy, is trying to educate corporations, and trying to get security built into products uh, before they cause issues. Uh, before vehicles are on the road that it can be broken into, before medical devices are causing loss of human life. Um, so I Am the Cavalry is definitely one, one way. Um, you talked about Peter Zatko's effort of uh, ranking software based on how much security is involved. Uh, Katie Masouris was recently involved in the DOD bug bounty, uh, getting that off the ground. Um, so there are a lot of people in the community who are involved, um, and, but I would like to see more. Uh, and I think part of that is an education on our side is that we just we read something in the news and we're like, oh, that's bad, and complain about it and don't actually stand up and say, well, how can I influence somebody to change this? And they don't look out to find the, where the public comment periods are, when they can yep. submit a comment, uh, or what hearing they can attend and, and raise, a, raise their hand and ask a question. Um, so part of that's on us to have more education so we know how to influence, um, but part of it's also trying to get people motivated to, to be the influencers. It, it's so changed over the years from the, from the early days mm -hmm. where people would save up their vulnerabilities so they could launch at DEF CON or Black Hat and get all this great press of look at what I just broke and then the vendor had to struggle to catch up. I mean, that was normal in the late, ni you know, in the late 90s. And boy, that just doesn't happen anymore. No, I mean, no. it just doesn't happen. Um, you know, it's expected that, for example, a DEF CON talk, you've got to talk about the vendor. If you don't say what vendor this is, then you're probably not going to get a talk. You're expected to release a demo, you know, show a demo and release the tool to go after that vulnerability. That's expected if you're coming out with something. But it's also expected that you've told the vendor beforehand. Yeah. Um, and another thing uh, that I heard about at, at, at B-Sides, there was someone from NIST who talked about their um, proposed authentication guidelines. And they've done something pretty cool where they've taken their proposed standard and put it up on GitHub. And you can submit comments. It's, it's not like the typical formal, you have to write a letter. You can like comment on GitHub. Um, and, That's awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's so and, cool. and they are 
they're dynamically adjusting this proposed standard as they get really comments cool. in before going to the official comment period that will come in a few months. Yeah, the NIST cybersecurity framework is an excellent example of, of industry, government, and hackers all kind of working together to come out with a standard. And I hope that standard is revved very quickly. That's it's starting really cool. to show its age. It's a great standard. I've seen a lot of organizations start to adopt it. Um, uh, I was going to say something else, and I lost it. Can, can I jump in? Um, yeah. So if you don't know what GitHub is that, that Larry just talked about, I mean, it is the repository for code. I mean, it is the place where people store um, store and can, sh and can share their code. So I mean, taking that means that government is coming to the hacker spaces, to the software developer spaces to look, for share, look to share, rather than the other way around. And Andy, since you're here from, from Huawei, I do want to point out that uh, on, the, on the CFP review board, on the talks for DEF CON, I've never heard anyone bring up someone's nationality. I mean, there might be a concern about how well they can speak English and can they deliver a good presentation, but they've, you know, I've never heard people say someone's from Huawei or Tihu or the rest, or, or from Kaspersky or from somewhere else and therefore they shouldn't talk. I mean, it's meant to be what, what's the content of the talk. So it's very, um, it's very egalitarian that way. Yeah, I think I'll say uh, to respond to that, um, efforts like I Am the Cavalry and other things uh, is an attempt to bridge some of the different stakeholders that live in these various ecosystems uh, to work on coming up with solutions. So, uh, you know, it's a fairly young, immature industry. If you look at like engineering, it's been going on thousands of years, medicine, thousands of years, cybersecurity, like 20. So we're, we're still pretty young. We don't quite have it all worked out yet. Um, the way to work it out is to get together and, and figure these things, uh, think these things through together. Um, I'll also say that something like a cybersecurity framework might not work for IoT type devices. So we might need to consider not an approach, but multiple approaches to solving some of these problems. Uh, the way I put it sometimes is, uh, you know, what worked for the first five billion won't work for the next five trillion um, that we're putting on the net. So um, that might be a, a, a challenge coming up, but I think we've got some of the smartest people that I've certainly ever met um, are both in DC and are in the hacker community and bringing those two together, as well as uh, people in industry and other places, is, a, I think, a good start. It's a good uh, framework to start working in. Um, so we'll go out to the audience again. Uh, we've got one in the very back. Uh, Michael Eisenberg from MITRE. I, I walked in as the discussion of electronic voting was going on, and I am frankly perplexed by the willingness to dismiss it uh, so quickly as not germane, apparently. Um, there were a number of articles that appeared during the week of Black Hat uh, in some of the trades about is the franchise the 19th critical infrastructure, and a lot of comments back saying, damn right, you don't get to have an economy with waterworks and electric power and aviation and health and manufacturing unless you can preserve the democracy. Uh, if the franchise is being corrupted by hacks, everything else is at risk. Uh, I would think that that would be something that ought to preoccupy all of us. Okay. I, I'm, I'm, I definitely associate my, myself with that, Michael. And the, um, uh, if, frankly, if I were back at the White House, I'd want to align the critical infrastructures to, to the HSPD, the Homeland Security Policy Directive that laid out the national essential functions. Um, and there, those constitutional functions, the, the um, enduring constitutional government and continuity of government framework, obviously voting is central to that. So it would, might be interesting in the new administration, whichever one that's going to be, if we look to try and realign those critical infrastructures to those national essential functions. Um, uh, I had a lot of comments that came out the week before, so two weeks ago um, during the week of Aspen, where I think we've got uh, four main things that I think the president ought to do. Um, one is to um, be sure to make the case, as, as we find out what happened, for example, with the DNC hack, to make sure that people understand this is about policy, not politics, D the defense of democracy, not defense of the Democrats. Um, second, to work with our especially European partners um, there are f critical French, German, and Austrian elections coming up, and, um, and outreach to those nations and let them know what, um, what happened to us and what they should look out for is, is I think, critical. Um, three, if it turns out the Russians were responsible for the DNC hack, um, I think uh, there's a bunch that we can do. The, the U.S. Cyber Command's 
um, uh, cyber mission, National Cyber Mission Force is, is supposedly already looking in red space to be able to disrupt in case something happens, and I, I would certainly ramp up the planning um, uh, for them. Uh, and last is, as we mentioned earlier, there's a lot more direct ways to mess with an election than, uh, than doxing, than releasing documents. So we've already got the President's National um, uh, Cyber Commission. Um, I, if I were him, I would ask them to form a separate task force just to look at elections. Have, um, and uh, maybe have two congressional co-chairs. We've already talked about Will Hurd, Republican from Texas. Um, and I would add to that uh, Representative Jim Langevin of Rhode Island. He had been Secretary of State of Rhode Island. He understands electoral systems through and through. He kicked off our event here when we were talking about the safety and security of electoral systems. Um, and, uh, and start looking at what we can do from now until November. Um, for example, even if we just came up with an emergency, we worked with Congress for an emergency fund to buy DDoS protection on the day of the event. So that way, if, if um, polling places are reporting in election results over the internet, which I bet a bunch are doing, that a simple DDoS that you rent for $1,000 can't take that down. Um, for a relatively low amount of money, we could start doing some of these common sense things that should make, make sense whatever political party you are. All right, well, uh, with that, I think we'll end it. Um, it's uh, 1.30, so thank you all for coming. Uh, we'll be around a little while longer with our uh, badges and with our hoodies. So if you Show want to come up and ask us questions in <laughs> person, you. you may. So, thanks, everybody, for being here. <laughs>